Oh, hi. Joe here. You know, I get asked all the time, why are all your videos about doom and gloom? You know, like, how come every video is an existential crisis with you, Joe? And you know, it's, it's a good question. And I've got a good answer. It's because that's all you people watch. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was... Now, last week I did a video on the Somerton Man Mystery in Australia, and uh, I thought it was a really good video. I was really proud of it. Um, you know, it was a really interesting story, lots of interesting twists and turns. Nick did a great job editing it. Ryan did a great job writing and researching it. I got emotionally invested in this video, which is not something that normally happens with most of my videos. Like this one, for example. And yeah, it tanked which stings. But the video on the Gulfstream Collapse did really well, the video on the Thwaites Glacier did really well, and I want to be able to pay my team, so here we are. And some of this is just because maybe that's stuff that you're more interested in as a, an audience. Uh, some of it has to do with YouTube. The number of impressions those videos get are always higher for some reason. Um, I don't want this to be a doom and gloom channel, but that's how YouTube works, you know? Sometimes you gotta lean into where the views are. But you know, I'm gonna stop. Uh, a YouTuber complaining about YouTube is the least interesting thing in the whole world. Uh, it's just a question I get asked a lot and I wanted to address it. Um, just like I'm gonna address the questions that the Patreon supporters asked for this lightning round video. Go. John Regal asked, what's one item from the past that you wish you held onto? Joy. What is one item from the present that you can see being thankful you've retained in the future? Something I wish I'd held onto from the past is my cell phone collection. Now for a long time, every time I got a new cell phone, I would hang on to the old one. So I had this whole collection of old cell phones. And I mean, this goes back to the very first cell phone that I had it was like one of those brick phones from like Wall Street in the, in the late eighties. Uh, and uh, I just, I thought it was really interesting. Like I, if, if I had it, I would have it up on this shelf probably because you could just sort of see the progression of technology over time. I think it's one of those few things that has progressed so much in our lifetimes uh, in the last 20 years or so that you can like really see the technology change. And what I think is really interesting is that when it got to the point that it was about this size, and this shape, this form factor, like it hasn't really shifted from this too much. And this is an iPhone, but there's, you know, other styles of phone that it's, it became this like black rectangle. And this is kind of where it stayed. It's found its final form. But if I remember correctly, I had an apartment fire many years ago, and I think that's when I lost it. Um, it didn't burn up in the fire, but there was a lot of stuff that I needed to throw away, and I think I just decided, eh, uh, why am I hanging on to all this? And I threw it away. And I wish I hadn't. I wish I As for things from my present that I'll be happy I held on to in the future, um, I'll say my wife. Aww. Let's just skip past the part where I basically turn my wife into an object, though. Fishtail asked, what hobbies do you have that don't increase the number of existential crises you deal with? You know, I really don't have a lot of hobbies these days, and that's really disturbing to me, honestly. Like, I have hobbies that I feel like I should be doing, like playing tennis or rock climbing, guitar. <laughs> Um, but I'm not really spending much time doing them. I, I, I used to be really into those things, and then I just kind of stopped. Yeah, now I feel like all I do is work. Work and play friggin' Brick Breaker on my phone. It's a stupid game I'm addicted to. Like, I've talked about this somewhere before. I, I need to watch more movies. I've fallen really, really behind on my movies. Um, I don't even know who, like, the popular actors are anymore, which is sad. But the only way that I can get myself, this is what's even sadder, the only way I can get myself to actually watch movies is if I frame it as work. If I, if I tell myself like, look, if you're gonna make movies someday, you need to know who the popular actors are and stuff. So you need to like go watch all these Netflix movies so you can be up on it. That's the only way I can make myself go watch movies. Just sitting back and watching a movie and relaxing, my brain starts to freak out and feels like I'm wasting time. And yet I play Brick Breaker on my phone for hours at a time. But no, this is something I need to work on, honestly. Um, I think hobbies are actually really important. You know, I've, I've said publicly that I feel like it's really important as you get older to connect back to the things that you loved when you were a kid, the things that you did, uh, you know, when you were a kid, because it was stuff that was done with no monetary incentive. It was stuff that was done with no specific goal. It was just stuff that you did that made you happy. And I think as you get older, you kind of lose touch with a lot of that stuff and it's important to, to reconnect with it. And I've been really terrible about that. I need, I need to work on it.
Brian Beswick asked, of all the proven and theoretical particles in science, which is your most favorite and why? Do normal people get asked questions like this? No, if, if, the, if, if I can pick between theoretical and real particles, I would have to pick the graviton because um, that would actually bridge the gap between the standard model and quantum theory. And if we could discover a graviton, that might give us the ability to manipulate gravity, which would just be the holy grail of everything, engineering, transportation, you name it. Like instead of having to burn fuel and chemical rockets or whatever, you could just, if you could manipulate gravity, then you could just create a gravity well in front of your rocket and just, you would just fall toward that gravity well indefinitely. We might finally have flying cars. Cole Parker asked, what are some crazy ideas out there for all the spent second stage rockets from SpaceX? With the 52 rocket launches this year, that's a lot of rocket engines. How about mounting a few to one of the new space stations? So this is actually pretty interesting because I looked around and I didn't find any ideas like this, though there have been lots of ideas about how to, you know, recover and reuse a second stage. In fact, back in 2011, that was exactly what was planned for SpaceX. That's what they wanted to do. They had this animation that shows how it would work. Yeah, in this idea, the top of the second stage actually had a heat shield on it. And then once it released the payload, it would just tuck the engine bell back into its body so that it wouldn't burn up and then re-enter into the atmosphere and then propulsively land. Now, there are a million different problems with this. The fact that the second stage has a vacuum optimized engine being one of them, so it'd be a lot more difficult to control in a sea level landing situation. The other being that it would require a lot of extra fuel to be able to propulsively land when it comes back down. So that would mean a bigger second stage and a heavier second stage, which means you need a bigger booster to get it up there. And now you start to see why Starship has to be so big to be 100% reusable. Also why Starship has both vacuum and sea level engines on it. So to reuse the engines by attaching them to the space station, um, I don't know, I mean, like, why, why does a space station need 52 engines on it? Like, the ISS has to raise and adjust its orbit, um, you know, from time to time, um, but the engines that it has on the supply and crew vessels, like the Progress and Zvezda, those get the job done. And as for future space stations, well, they don't exist, so. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I guess the solution that SpaceX has come up with to avoid wasting so many rocket engines is just to get Starship operational. And, you know, by the time any new space stations are operating, Starship would probably be their flagship vehicle. Now, I guess you could combine all those second stages and their engines into some kind of interplanetary ship, um, but that would probably require a level of space construction that we haven't really mastered yet. Uh, plus, they would need to have extra fuel to be able to maneuver to this particular location in orbit. And let's just face it, there's too much space junk up there right now anyway, so, I don't know, I think right now the best option is to just burn them up in the atmosphere. Willy Hilly Billy asked, Been wondering, if the periodic table of elements is stated to be fully completed, if this applies to all the elements in the known universe, could it be possible that if a developing alien civilization were to attempt to categorize the elements, their table would end up pretty much similar, if not identical, to ours? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, that, that could sort of serve as a bit of a universal language between us and other alien civilizations. That's exactly what they use in the Voyager record. They um, had a symbol on there for, the, for hydrogen and the hyperfine transition to communicate with the potential alien species that might find it. So yeah, I mean, that might be the first way that we're able to communicate with an alien species because the elements in the universe would be the same everywhere you go, you know? Um, I'm sure they would have different names for them. They might categorize them a little bit differently, but you know, the atomic weights and whatnot would be the same. Except theirs might have unobtainium and vibranium in it. Mark Hoffman asked, the recent report by the UN IPCC highlighted increases in severity and intensity of weather-related disasters. With that, how many longer-term disasters might we be overdue for already? E.g. the Cascadia San Andreas big ones, Yellowstone supervolcano, which you already did, CMEs, asteroid impacts, etc. Doom and gloom, yes please. So yeah, in that aforementioned uh, Yellowstone video that I did, I actually got a lot of requests to talk about the Cascadia earthquake threat, and uh, it's super interesting for sure. So the Cascadia Subduction Zone, or CSZ, that lies off the coast of uh, US and Canada on the northwest side, uh, that's where the Pacific Plate, or technically the Juan de Fuca Plate, uh, meets the North American Plate. And this area has been known to produce mega thrust earthquakes, the most famous one being in the year 1700 that was strong enough to cause a tsunami in Japan. They estimated that earthquake would be a category nine, uh, or a magnitude nine, uh, and it produced what they call ghost forests, which are beaches along Oregon and Washington that um, were, they're covered with tree stumps because the land level dropped by two meters and killed entire forests. Yeah, if that were to happen again today, it would pretty much devastate Vancouver, Seattle, Tacoma, Portland, and maybe strong enough to trigger another eruption on the San Andreas Fault further south. 
Not to mention it would probably set off some of the volcanoes that line the west coast like Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, Mount Hood, and Crater Lake. Now they've estimated there have been about 41 eruptions over the last 10,000 years. Um, and they've been at very irregular intervals, but the average is around 240 years between events and seeing that the last big one was 322 years ago, well, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. The periods between events have been as long as like 900 years. Uh, and it's been estimated there's about a 37% chance of a magnitude eight or higher earthquake in the next 50 years. So not great. Now CMEs aren't quite as threatening as they've been made out to be. Um, these are coronal mass ejections if you don't know what that means. Uh, basically giant solar flares. So back in 2012, when there was some of the end of the world stuff, hysteria going on, some people were claiming that a CME could wipe out the planet. Uh, obviously that's not what would happen. CMEs are more of a threat to our satellites and electricity infrastructure, which is a big deal for sure, don't get me wrong, but it's not like it would directly kill people. The biggest one in recent history was the Carrington event in 1859. Um, I covered this in a video a while back, but uh, it apparently put so much energy through the telegraph wires that some of the offices caught on fire. Uh, and the fear is that if something like that happened today, um, you know, it would probably destroy electrical transformers and maybe destroy entire electrical grids. The good news is that the sun is being watched constantly by a slew of telescopes and satellites and we'd be able to see it coming. Uh, and it's possible that electric companies could probably intentionally black out the grid temporarily to avoid permanent damage. Our satellite infrastructure would take a hit though. Um, it wouldn't be good. It definitely wouldn't be good. Uh, but they say supposedly they happen every 300 years or so. And so the chance of it happening in the next decade or so is around 12%. Now, when it comes to asteroids and comets, there's actually a really interesting pattern that's been found. So this was back in 2015, a couple of scientists named Michael Rampino and Ken Caldera, I think I said that right? Uh, they were studying mass extinction events and noticed that there was a major impact event or mass extinction event every 26 million years with like weird regularity. So the theory seems to be that something is disrupting the Oort cloud on regular intervals and causing comets to rain down. And there are two leading explanations for this. One is that the sun may have a binary star. Uh, that swings closer to uh, our solar system every once in a while, just close enough to where some of the comets got bumped out of the Oort cloud. And this might, you know, occur on a regular interval every 26 million years. Um, in fact, some scientists gave this, this theoretical star a name. They named it Nemesis, which is pretty good, I gotta say. It should be noted that most people who have studied the uh, binary star idea have come to the conclusion that this star does not exist. Uh, though I guess it's possible that it could be like a planet nine or some other celestial body. The other theory is that our solar system as it goes around the galaxy actually oscillates up and down across the galactic plane. And the galactic plane contains more dust clouds that might be just concentrated enough to create some drag on the Oort cloud around our solar system and dislodge some comets. And if this theory is true, then you can rest easy. We may have a nice break for a while. We just crossed the galactic plane about 2 million years ago. So, uh, Rest easy, you got 24 million years to party. But if you're the type of person that would rather party all by yourself, you can do that with Raycon earbuds. They're the sponsor of the video. Raycon makes high quality, super comfortable earbuds at about half the price of others on the market. They come in a variety of covers and deliver full rich tones that make even the biggest music snobs say, mama mia. That's something music snobs say, right? They come with a variety of silicone earpieces to fit any ear comfortably, which has always been one of my biggest problems with earbuds. Uh, I used to have a pair of earbuds that cost way more than these do, and I couldn't listen to them for more than 30 minutes or 45 minutes without them hurting my ears. That is not a problem with these guys. But yeah, I got these everyday earbuds a couple years ago, and I've never had a reason to price them. I really like them a lot, and they don't fall out. As you can see. Yeah, they fit right here in this little quick and easy charger. The earbuds themselves last about eight hours. The charger lasts about 32 hours before you have to charge it up again. They connect effortlessly with my phone. I've never had a problem with it. I wish other devices work this well. If you want celebrity endorsements, they've been endorsed by Snoop Dogg, Brandy, Melissa Etheridge, Ray J. If you want regular people endorsements, they've gotten over 48,000 five-star reviews online. And if you want my endorsement, well, you have it, my friend. You have it. The fact is they're a great pair of earbuds at a fraction of the price of a lot of the others out there. So if you're in the market for some new ones, give them a try. You can get 15% off if you go to buyraycon.com slash Joe Scott. You'll get a discount on a great pair of earbuds and it does help support the channel. So again, it's buyraycon.com slash Joe Scott. Links in the description.
Big thanks to Vraycon for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the answer files on Patreon and the channel members that are forming an awesome community, supporting, being really great people. I cannot thank you guys enough. We got some new channel members whose names I need to murder real quick. We've got Aaron Jones, <laughs> Cat in the Hat, uh, Cobus Van Der Merway, Karen Sheets, Edward the First, Josh Farmer, Leandro, Joshua Clark, Roar, I think. Seek Sustainable Japan, Chris Boucher, uh, Michael Augustine, Kimber Dillon, Doug Van Sickle, and Duzan Mudrinik. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, get access to exclusive live streams and whatnot, and get a little uh, cute little thing by your face that makes you uh, stand out in the comments down there, just hit the little join button down below. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you might like this one. So trust Google. They, 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 they watch you all the time, so they know. Uh, there's also all these others on the side down here that have my face on them. Go ahead and take a look. And if you like them and want to uh, subscribe, I invite you to subscribe. Come back to videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.